Welcome to Inbox. I'm your host, Afaf Bin Fan. Today, you will discover why people are excited to rock climb. We will also uncover the taboo behind the Chinese medicine and rediscover the bassoon through a man who take us on a musical journey. First, we begin with the rock climbing. There are many different reasons why people climb. The exhilaration from the physical challenge and mental stamina are just to name a few. Others enjoy the bonding experience, whether it be with a group of climbers or solo climbing. Inbox sent Reese Chunk to try this popular and growing sport. It's energetic, challenging, entertaining. It can even build relationship. This is rock climbing. For me, it's a family sport. My son also climbs. It's good outdoor activity. He, he started climbing with me when he was about three. Mm -hmm. I started taking him out, and the whole thing I always said with him was, you, can't, you, you don't have to climb, but you have to at least come camping. Outdoor rock climbing is not only just a sport, but also a bridge for family relationships. It's such a bonding experience because we have to have ultimate trust in each other because Brian's at one end of the rope and I'm at the other end of the rope. So if anything goes wrong at any point in the climb, then we have to be looking out for each other and it's very possible we could either hurt each other or really help save each other if something goes wrong. Today, rock climbing is a unique extreme sport which is derived from mountain climbing. According to the historical records, Yosemite's famous Half Dome was first conquered 140 years ago. This sport requires experience, stamina, and also a cool head. Hence, a famous climber who is professional in the speed rock climbing always tries to challenge himself. His achievements have made him quite famous as a rock climber. I've climbed the the route, uh, it's called the Nose Route um, up El Capitan in Yosemite. And I climbed that with a young man, Alex Honnold. Um, initially, that route was climbed in seven, well, 12 days it took them to climb this route in, back in the 1950s. It's the most famous route. The Nose Route is the most famous big wall route in the world. Not only that, climbers seem to have something in common. They love learning new things from their friends and enjoy the community as well. I've been climbing for about 11 years and I just love rock climbing and watching these films is a good way to get together with the climbing community and your friends and kind of see what um, the athletes are doing right now. But what's the most important thing for climbers? Beat myself from before and climbing has taught me that I can do something really hard for me climbing and then months, years, decades later, I can do something even harder. It's about self-control. What about safety? It's very, uh, like you've seen in the gym, there's climbing that's really quite safe. It's just you're doing it for the athletic exercise. Actually, the rock walls at an indoor gym are not really made of rock at all. The handholds feel like rock and allow the climber to have as realistic an experience as possible. <laughs> And I heard that you tried climbing already. Before we go climbing, there are important steps we need to remember. So it's always important to double check your harness to make sure everything is set correctly. Because if you're up top and it's not set correctly, you could fall and hurt yourself. So we always check that our harness is double back, which means that the strap goes through, go, goes back over and around. And then you want to make sure your legs are clipped in and you're nice and comfortable. Yeah, and I think good. I'm good. Great. The last step before we go climbing is to tighten our snap ring. Now try it. Now hit it. Oh, okay. Now I'm ready, so let's go climbing. This is not an easy sport. I try to use all my body muscles, but it's also a very fun process. I'm tired. Big Red, at your 11 o'clock. Yep, yep, left foot. Yep. You got it, I got you. Come on. I never thought I can do that, but today I did that. Wow, I'm very excited about that. Every expert 
was once a beginner. First time I ever went to the Red River Gorge in Kentucky, and I saw a really easy climb, and I said, oh, cool, I want to do it. It was like 80 feet high. I climbed up about 50 feet, and there's a cave. Whoa. I climb into the cave, and I freak out. All my friends are laughing at me. I'm freaking out. And... You can spend a few hours a week at a gym, getting in shape, and getting to know some climbing buddies. Physically, it's a great workout. Um, yeah, it works out every muscle, muscles you don't even know you had. Mentally, um, it's climbing is like very mind focused. You have to figure out problems. Um, these are all different challenges you can try and climb. Um, so you have to figure out how your body works with every climb. Rock climbing is good activity with your family and friends. Are you ready to go rock climbing on this weekend? Let's go. Do you think rock climbing make people younger? I wish, because then I will never stop. <laughs> Thank you, Reese, for the revealing look into the world of rock climbing. Is it an Asian Chinese secret or good medicine? We will know the answer when we come back. Stay tuned. Chinese medical practices have been around for thousands of years, but they still have difficulty finding acceptance in the United States. We found a Chinese doctor who is on a mission to change just that. He is blending Asian practices with modern medicine. Wesley Tsao is on a location to bring us the story. Healing. Up, down, eight times. Teaching. Dr. Philip yeah. In is changing lives by combining Eastern and Western medicine. I could feel the energy moving in my body. <laughs> I mean, I felt things, my liver, my pancreas, you know, my head, my... Oh, that's good. I could feel... Usually when you feel the energy, that will work. Yeah. Philip Yan came from China, and now he's doing Chinese treatment as his career in California. This is the classrooms, and we do the teaching here. We, right now we have around 100 students. They are having class. Yeah, they are having class here. Actually, when I uh, was young, I accepted the Chinese medicine treatment. I took a lot of herbs when I got sick, and uh, later, uh, because of my health issues, so I um, learned, um, I practiced in the martial arts and then practiced Qigong. And uh, later, I practiced medical Qigong to treat myself. Yan began his path of Chinese medical treatment in China, but continued learning these techniques in the United States. Yeah, these are the raw herbs. Mm -hmm. Uh, usually we cook it by um, prescriptions. In the United States, we call, all call them food. Like this one. This one is uh, actually American ginseng. American ginseng, uh, this can be eaten. It looks like just uh, like a root. It's, are you sure it can be eaten? It is root, yeah, you can try. Oh, really? Yeah. Actually, it's okay. good for your energy. Oh, really? <laughs> Make you young. Oh? Uh, keep you young. Oh, wow. <laughs> It tastes like chips and a little bit sweet. It tastes really good. Yeah, a little bit sweet, a little bit bitter. What motivates you to like, continue doing this as your career in the United States? In the Western world, we have more information about the Western medicine. This is something we need to learn. Like we have a lot of friends uh, who are either post doctors or medical doctors, uh, or even some students, they are very, very specialized in anatomy. This is very, very helpful in application of Chinese medicine. Mm -hmm. So when we combine these together, make it more perfect, get it working even better. The cup. And slide the cup. This to detoxify the body and also generate the circulation. Detoxify means to suck up Suck out the toxins inside. 
get rid of the stagnations. From Yin, yeah. we see the combination of the Eastern and the Western. He shared uh -huh. what he learned and contributes to the people in need. Well, when I was in Australia, I got hit by a, like a truck, a mini truck, right here, full on. And I Joe Broda is a student of Dr. Yen's and was also a patient. He came to Dr. Yen after a car accident. They took me to emergency and uh, I couldn't move my arm because it, uh, something happened in my shoulder. What I got from Philip Yang, Dr. Philip Yang, was the chi will put it together or will hold it together. And so he treated me and it was like, oh, it started to work. Patients usually have a hard time trusting Chinese treatment when they first meet Dr. Yan. I felt like on the verge of crying, like just like, is this going to, I say I feel sad now, like is it going to get any better? Because it's, people don't realize how much that affects your life. I felt really helpless like, I, and hopeless, like here we go, I'm just going to spend money on one more thing and it's not going to work. So he probably had a little bit of an uphill battle with me because I wasn't really trusting. This is one of the clinical rooms. Oh, it looks really so nice. Yeah, we do the treatment here. Uh -huh. <laughs> and how do you earn like the trust from the patients? Some of the patients are the first timers. They say, oh, they're scared of needles. I said, okay, how about I just give you a try one needle. If the needle hurts, we can stop. Then they try to find, oh, it's not painful. When you get the needle at first, do you feel really nervous? Or do you yeah, like I feel nervous. Do you scary? Yeah, I feel kind of But it doesn't hurt after. If they find the effectiveness, then they will trust more, then they'll come, and they will get more uh, communication and they get more trust. I love Dr. Yang. <laughs> he's great, and he, and he lets me kind of poke fun at him, because half the time I don't know what he's doing, but it works. And I make jokes to him, but he's okay with it. You know, he's humble enough and secure enough with his abilities. He's very easy okay. to talk to, and um, I just trust him. He always has energy. You can't keep up with him, you know? And uh, so he'll, he'll treat hundreds of people, treat people during the day. He'll teach at night. How in the heck does he do it? People want to be around him because he has a pure, kind of compassionate but powerful way. Exhale through the mouth. From Eastern to Western culture, Yan is the pain of many people and what he does has a great effect on people's lives. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. And I see you. And good luck. Thank you, Wesley for that very insightful report about Dr. Philip Young. In a moment, we will take you on a musical journey with an electric bassoonist. Don't go away. The bassoon is a classical instrument that has been enjoyed for over 400 years, though it has often been relegated to the back row of the orchestra. Today, it is featured as a solo instrument. Even so, you might not be familiar with what a bassoon sounds like. Our correspondent, Lorena Bennett, has the story of a man who has taken this classical instrument on an amazing journey. An electric bassoonist? Who knew? Traditionally known as a classical instrument in orchestra. But you don't play it classically, do you? Uh, no, I don't. I've done all kinds of different things. But, yeah. The bassoon is not typically plugged into an amp like a bass guitar, so it is unusual to see and surprising to hear. I did what everybody does in the beginning, you know. It's different, I think, in the 80s than it is now. Very cool looking. It's actually a lot harder than it, you know, appears. For the longest time, I played basically, um, you know, classical on bassoon. I didn't even think about improvising. Until he heard... Uh, Jimi Hendrix. I heard Jimi Hendrix, and it just blew my mind. This was his first album under his own name as a solo artist. One of my 
favorite sessions? One take live, no overdubs, with a lot of high energy. As a recording producer, it was quite interesting to see Paul work his magic. All kinds of effects on his instrument, and so it sounds at times like a guitar. I've got this crazy idea. Which was to take a small microphone and simply drop it. Down the instrument through an amplifier. It was the most god-awful racket you ever heard. It was a fantastic sound. Paul is the world's greatest jazz bassoonist, and he was one of the best students I've ever had. Echo really is a special place for those A-naturals. An expert on fantastic bassoon sounds is Stephen Paulson. Good, and it's find even a, a darker place for the A-naturals. He played jazz saxophone and jazz bassoon, but he wanted to actually get his degree in classical bassoon and legit bassoon. You know, normal stuff as a bassoon, I really enjoy that. Um, just keep you grounded. I don't want to always be known as the, the, this freaky guy all the time, you know. I don't really mind. Well, he didn't really mind when Cirque du Soleil hired him for his unique skills. And one, two, three, four. Like improvising, which is required for their shows. That was an amazing experience. I mean, these people put their lives on the line every day. And if you are, if I play a wrong note, nobody dies, you know what I mean? We both found ourselves coming back from our various assignments with Cirque du Soleil. And Paul had been in Japan, I had been in Canada. Their assignments were disrupted for different reasons. It was just a matter of time when they would make a connection to each other. Cirque du Soleil in Tokyo, where he had uh, a very creative job that probably only Paul could do, that particular job that he was doing, and it, it fit in really well. He was supporting his whole family in Tokyo on that job, and he had to reinvent himself very quickly when that dried up and he had to come back. A natural disaster occurred and forced immediate evacuation. A tsunami and uh, earthquake in Japan happened. I was over there when that happened. So you come back, you have to start over again, and it's really different. Ariana also faced uneasy transitions. Reinvention was necessary. That's when she and Paul met. And we were sort of th trying to figure out what now and what to do next. So together they collaborated and created the band Oon. The name itself is a play on words. If you take bass and bassoon, the bass cancels each other out, and Oon is what's left. <laughs> Oon might be what's left of their name, but there's a lot more to their music. Both instruments don't sound like you typically hear them in, in an ensemble. Like the bassoon is much brighter than you would hear it. And actually, it, it took Paul a little bit to get used to that. The main stuff happened for me when I started to mix it. Like, how do we blend the two instruments and, and balance them and, and still get a full sound? A lot of it is, is just for me experimenting with the tools that I have and, and see what sound we can get. Yeah. Bass and bassoon, it's just, we find it so compatible. Uh, so many things worked. Well, I mean, this is one take, there is no... I, I think it's still an ongoing process for us to figure out the, the perfect un sound. So far, we are very happy how it turned out. So that's why we called our CD Polaris, which is like the North Star, you know, so kind of when you're lost, you look at the compass of your heart, and we just followed that. One thing I'd always say for anybody who's involved in art or maybe in any field at all is I'd never think, oh my God, now I've made it. Because the minute you kind of just like, you can relax, but you just can't, like, uh, you have to stay involved. Involvement may be in large groups or as a soloist. Just don't forget to plug in. Something like that? 
Thank you, Lorena, for that wonderful report. That was music to my ears. He never skipped a beat. We climbed new heights with rock climbing. We stepped out of our comfort zone with Chinese medicine and opened our ears to new sounds of the bassoon. Thank you for joining us this week. See you next time. I'm Afaf Bin Fan and you have been watching Inbox.